Well, thank you very much. Welcome to uh, This Week in Venture Capital. Uh, very happy to film from New York this week. It's the first time we've actually filmed in New York, and we have uh, Mo Koifman here from uh, Spark Capital. Very happy to have Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, very happy to have you today. Glad to have you in New York. Yeah, no, it's great to be here. You know, you're bi coastal now. I, well, I don't know. I was Almost. just and I was just in China uh, two weeks ago, so I feel I like mean, you two call that tri coastal. I don't know where I am. I don't know. The times I, I, the only thing I do know is I'm not sleeping. Oh. Um, and, at, and least, at least we're somewhere, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I have to tell you that uh, New York is hot right now. I mean, and not it, just the weather. Not just the weather. It is, yeah, but it is hot out. Uh, but what I'm hearing in Silicon Valley is people are telling me that they're either establishing offices or outposts, or they're doing a lot more traveling out here. They're doing a lot more early stage deals out here. And, and yet LA is only an hour flight. And I'm not saying they don't come to LA, but New York has this buzz about it. Is that right? Yeah. Um, you, sorry, you're based out of Boston. Uh, yeah, the firm's based out of Boston. I'm in Boston a bunch, but I also spend a bunch of time here as well and have been a kind of native New Yorker. I grew up in the, in the burbs, but have sort of been in, 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 in this market and worked in this market for 10 years before joining Spark. So uh, I have pretty deep roots here. Um, yeah, I, I think New York is hot. I, 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 um, I'm a little bit reluctant to jump on, you know, the, to jump the shark and yeah. jump on the bag wagon a bit too much. I think it's been bandied about pretty significantly in the community. Um, I think there are very specific reasons why New York is hot. I think there are specific reasons why New York is hot versus LA. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's a very deep entrepreneurial culture that exists in this city and always right. has. There's an immigrant culture. There's a, I've been reading a a book lately that's kind of in my head about this new creative cl this creative class um, that gravitates to markets like New York, and I think um, you know I think there's a there's a there's a core base of folks here that are that are driven to and pulled by entrepreneurship. I think historically it hasn't necessarily been pointed at the same sectors yeah. that we invest in, um, but I think increasingly it is, and there's there's a whole bunch of structural reasons about why. So, and I and I'm and I'm gonna come in a moment to introduce you, and I, we yeah. should do that. But since we're on this uh, thought of New York, I'd like to follow up on it, which is, so I hear it's hot, and you know I've been here now for four five days, and I keep asking the question like, how's VC, how's tech, how's entrepreneurship. And despite the gloss of what you read in the headlines front of New York Magazine, obviously you have uh, Foursquare and Tumblr and you know some high profile companies. Uh, I'm still hearing a lot of people saying there's not enough venture capital here. I'm still hearing people say it's very hard with tech resources because you're competing still with Wall Street and the salaries that that can draw in. Is that true? Or, you know, there's still some challenges here? Um, I think there are challenges here. I think there are challenges everywhere. I want to take the kind of people point first because, yeah. you know, I think that's a challenge regardless. I, I talk to people in the Valley. I talk to people in San Francisco. I guess you, you, have, know, the companies might, you have the Google effect. Yeah, right? well, for Google, Facebook, Twitter, you know, yeah. companies just sucking up the talent. Yeah. You talk to people in San Francisco, they say, gosh, you know, we should have located our office in the Valley because we can't get any developers here in San Francisco. Yeah. You know, I think finding great people is generally really, really hard and yeah. very competitive in any market that you're in. I think New York is no exception. I think Wall Street is still a draw, although I think the bloom's off the rose a little bit in terms yeah. of you know the, the tech and, and, and new media and internet's ability to kind of grab those people. But but I think um, you know I think what's happening. This is kind of a, a, a larger trend is that with the costs of startups at least initially coming down, yeah. shared and you know leased infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. You know the cloud. Um, I think you're seeing a lot more companies born. Yeah. But they all need like a couple front end guys, a couple back end guys. They all need a UX and a design guy. And those people are earning good money. Aren't and those they? people are making good money <laughs> and finding really finding a really yeah. good UX or design guy. Like yeah, you tough. know how hard that and is. And what about this, Mo? Okay, so like UX, I think is going to come from New York, or LA, or San Francisco in the sense that it's a design skill, right? Um, but one of my favorite New York early stage entrepreneurs is a guy named Ari Jacoby. Do you yep. know Ari? I do. So, I, you know, he's my kind of entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I think he's doing, if I'm not mistaken, and I hope I don't quote this wrong, but I think he's doing a lot of his development in Philly. So he's got ad sales and operations in New York because he's serving, you know, the media sector. And yet he can hire people on a more affordable basis with a lower churn rate. Do you ever see that? Is that a trend yeah, I mean, or is it, it a one off? I think there are people doing it in that way. I think I know I was talking to another 
someone else in the in the business last night and talking about how the talent in Russia is so prolific on the on the engineering side. I think you can have outsourced teams. I'm involved in the business right now. Where we're talking about kind of leveraging a whole a whole bunch of outsourced resources in, in Eastern Europe. Um, I think it really depends. I think when you're doing consumer web, you know, specifically on the front end stuff, specifically on the product stuff, you really want those people close to the CEO. Yeah. Um, and even just the, the 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 basic architecture, you know, it really depends how you construct your team. There are some companies we have a couple Israeli companies. Yeah. Um, there are some where it works better than others, having R and D in Israel and uh, you know the the rest and of the I, team I guess here. Just to take a case in point, you guys are an investor in Boxy. We're an investor and in Boxy. Boxy yeah. has a lot of its R and D in Israel. Talk about how and, that works. And Five Men as well, right? Um, which is another company in New York doing quite well. You know it. It, it's great, uh, uh, it's helped build a tremendous product, but over time you end up in these situations where you try and figure out you know, what, what happens there, what happens here, how do we organize around that most effectively, and I think that's just the nature of any company that's growing with kind of multiple, uh, with, with overlapping functions in multiple areas. So you know, I don't think there's a blanket answer for it. I think it can work for a lot of companies and not work as well for other companies. I think in the consumer web, mm -hmm. it, it's harder than the enterprise where you can really uh, segment out some of the development activities yeah. a little differently. What I, what I like to tell people, Mo, my advice is head of engineering needs to be with head of product management needs to be with CEO. And I don't think you can break up those three now. So what I've always believed is you can have some amount of development done in multiple locations. Uh, yes, there are tools you can use right. these days. And you can have rock star developers. Maybe they want to stay in New Mexico, as is the case of a company called Collecta. Right. And, and you can make that work. But I just think that if you think about customer development, where you're constantly listening to what your customer is saying, getting the feedback, feeding it through product management, getting fast turns on engineering, those three have to be in the same I location. think that's ideal and, and probably right for both consumer businesses and enterprise businesses. I think having um, the, the kind of the, the brain center of product and engineering kind of in tandem there with the CEO is ideal. It's not always the case, but ideally, that's kind of what I was, what I was alluding to before, when you can segment off pieces of development teams and activity, that's one thing. If the entire kind of product and engineering operation is somewhere and the business operation is somewhere else, I think it becomes trickier to, to really all be on the same page. And those right. are, you know, it's manageable, but far from ideal, I think. So uh, we probably should have introduced you up front. Mo, you are rare in the VC world in the sense, or at least in the minority in the sense that you had operational experience before. You graduated undergrad from Wharton. Mm, Wharton and the college at Penn. Yeah, so um, it's funny, my wife has an MBA from Wharton and she tells me the really smart people <laughs> are the Wharton undergrads. Well, you know, it's funny, I'll tell you something about that and I think it's relevant is I, I did, um, you know, Penn's an awesome place for a number of reasons, one, one of which is they have multiple schools. They have the college, the, the business school, Wharton, and the engineering yeah. school. I did a degree, I did two degrees when I was there. I did a BA in English at the college and a BS in finance at Wharton. And I'm actually pissed I didn't do an engineering degree, but that's an, another story yeah. for another time. Yeah. And my dad's an engineer, so I really have no excuse, or, although maybe that's why I didn't do an engineering <laughs> degree. Anyhow, um, the, the beauty of that was I was able to study literature and liberal arts and all that good stuff while also getting a finance degree. And I will tell you that not just in my personal life, but in my professional life, I think that the, the liberal arts degree uh, has served me as well and probably better than the finance degree. So I'm going to echo that, which is I had a double major undergrad. I studied economics and political science, and it was my hedge about business versus law school. We all have one, but, right? you know, I grew up in the L.A. law day. It was like sexy. You wanted to be a lawyer. God knows why. Um, and uh, um, ultimately, if I think about what came from poli sci for me, critical reasoning, yep. which is important in business, and writing and communication. Skills. Same in literature. Yeah. It's exactly, it's how to think and how to communicate. And, and those and, are very, very, very and as long, powerful as, as long as you're mathematic, the finance stuff isn't that hard so to pick I, up. You know, I, I, I find it ironic, there's a nice iron, irony that you have a BS in finance. Well, yep. irony? <laughs> Absolutely, but I will tell you that um, the finance stuff, I came out and like a lot of my classmates at the time, you know, I worked at a bank for a couple of years, yeah. and I had a lot of friends who came from Hamilton and Wesleyan and yeah. 
they didn't learn any finance there, I promise you. And they, you know, six to nine months in, were doing the same high-level math and analysis and spread, you know, we're as good a spreadsheet jockey as anybody in the business. So, yeah. you know, I think you can learn, those are mathematical disciplines that you can learn. You're not talking about really, really, really complex stuff at the end of the day. I mean, it's still pretty confined in terms of the kind of math that you're doing. And I, I think, um, I think it's much harder to teach somebody how to how to write effectively, how to communicate, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, Penn and Wharton have been getting a lot of attention lately. I think the Invite Media guy. Absolutely, uh, it's a topic du jour, and and um, um, you know, I, uh, kudos to those guys, and uh, really psyched for them. It's it's really. Uh, great to see young entrepreneurs come out of how, Penn. How old is the guy? Is he 24 or something? Uh, at best. At I best, think. okay. I think so, yeah. Gotcha. There are two of them. Uh, great guys. Um, and, and it's just great to see. And, and I've you know, been talking to a lot of folks in the community, of kind of reading it on Twitter, et cetera, and it, it seems that it's not just them, but there's a handful of and great I, entrepreneurs coming I out just of funded, and I can't talk about it yet, but uh, a very young entrepreneur out of Wharton. Great. Um, undergrad. And uh, one of my my personal favorite, for personal reasons, companies in your portfolio, the CFO is a Wharton undergrad. It's called Kickapps. Oh yeah, uh, David Laughter. Uh, David's and, fantastic. Yeah, I love David. And he he and I worked together in London. He was uh, my CFO. Yeah, my first company. Uh, I, you know what? I, I remember that yeah. actually. And he formerly worked with GRP. Actually, he went the opposite way of me. I rescued him from the dark side. <laughs> and brought him over to operation. He's he's, uh, he's as good a CFO as, as we have in the portfolio. He's fantastic. Um, what, tell me about kickoffs, and we're just like all over the map here, and I promise I'll tighten okay. it and bring it back. But Ning, I originally thought when David told me about kickoffs, I'm like, that sounds like a really interesting company, but Mark Andreessen, Ning, they're kind of going to kick your ass. And Ning just has gone nowhere, and kickoffs seems to have moved in a different direction and get more focused and win a lot of customers. What's going on? Um, well, Kickups again, another New York company, so yeah. should should give them should give, a, give a little more props to, yeah. to the New York market. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is a is a product market fit thing, and kind of where you where you point the the product. You know, Kickups started going at the enterprise, which is a much harder sale, yeah. far longer sales cycle, as we know, but bigger deals, more predictable over time. Um, it's kind of a different customer base, whereas Ning went at the consumer in a different way. And, and Ning went after the free white label social network. Correct. And eventually they gave that up and moved only to paid, right? Correct. And so Kickups went at the went at the enterprise with a paid model. Ning went at the consumer with a free model. And Kickups got traction there and now is moving more downstream towards I don't I wouldn't say the consumer, but more the small business. Right. Um, and they've actually widened the product set. So it's not just kind of a social CMS or social media tools. It's really an entire um, kind of web development kit. Right. Uh, and we've seen you know, another non-Spark portfolio company, but a great company in New York who's been very successful, actually two of them, one Wix okay. and another called Squarespace, okay. that have done a great job with a software as a service model for SMBs, you know, online customer acquisition, you can reach SMBs now much more effectively on the yeah, web. Yeah. They, they think, you know, that the, the typical person running an SMB goes to Google and types in what they're looking for, just like a consumer does. Well, the one warning sign, Mo, that I give people who ask me about SMB all the time, what you need to think about is, does the SMB have a person at that company whose job it is to implement your software because what often happens is they don't have the skills. I agree with you. And they sign up and they'll they'll pay you, but they won't get the value. And if they don't get the value, it's hard to sell. So what we're talking about here is mission critical software. Yeah. You know? I mean, this is a whole different world. We're, we're talking about running your website. <laughs> I know. So if you're if you're if you if you're an SMB yeah. and you need a website, yeah. And you're going to transact and conduct business through that website, yeah. and you're going to find a provider, and they're going to host it for you, and they're yeah. going to provide you the platform. It's different than you know a performance management tool or. A but so SMB, just to be clear, that everybody knows is small and medium-sized business. And yeah. So maybe we're talking more about MB, and then they kind of yeah. have this classification of Soho, small office, home office. But yeah. what it seems every company I know who has a 24-year-old founder wants to target bars and restaurants. You know, because that's what they live in. Between, by, from the maybe in New 18. York, and, and but just everywhere, L.A., San Francisco, yeah, big and, cities, and and it's very hard to reach these customers. And you know, I, I did this analogy. I, I wrote about it on my blog, which was elephant, deer, and rabbits. 
and and it's it's um, how much meat is on the animal that you mm -hmm. hunt. And I always say uh, startups should focus on deer because if you get an elephant, let's say you land AT and T as a customer and it's your first customer, oftentimes your company gets subsumed into serving the big guy. What I worry about in SMB is too many companies have this mistaken belief that I'm gonna sign up all these bars, I'm gonna get all these rabbits, and they look so easy to catch. They're fast, and when you get them, there's not that much meat. But I'll, two, so two things. I wanna talk about the rabbits, and I wanna talk about SMBs. Yeah. The other thing about the rabbits is they're very promiscuous. Yeah. They like to sleep around. Oh, wow, that's interesting. And so when you get one rabbit, sometimes we, you get could, another rabbit. We could venture into some pretty bad Sometimes you get another rabbit, <laughs> yeah. and they're very viral creatures. Okay. And so, there's a whole other effect that you get if you tap into the right vein with the rabbits that all of a sudden you got rabbits everywhere and then they turn, then it's more like rats or mice even. Right, right. Can't, can't even get rid of them if you want to. Right. So it is a little bit more of a lightning in a bottle thing, but yeah. when you catch it, it's pretty it incredibly make, powerful. Like a, like a Zendesk seems to have tapped well, into Now I'm thinking bit. in the consumer side, like a Foursquare or oh. a, No, but the difference it, with Foursquare, the difference in my opinion, I mean, you guys are-, are We're you, not investors. You're not investors, so, oh, so we can talk more openly then. <laughs> The thing with Foursquare is- Although we're big fans and yeah, love Dennis and the yeah, guys love but, the product. But. Yeah, no, and I wasn't gonna critique. I was more gonna say Foursquare focuses on the consumer and by having the consumer and driving the consumer to venues, they can engage those venues in right. a different way. So let's talk about SMBs, because yeah. I, I think, I didn't mean to veer us away, but I, I, I think it's an interesting point about whether you go, for, whether you go elephant hunting or not, vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the consumer. Um, at, with SMBs, I think that um, the web has democratized. It's, it used to be the big black sinkhole in the business, like SMBs. They're impossible to get. The only one who ever got them was you into can, it. No, you can't yeah. invest in a. You can't invest in a sales force because they can't get them effectively. It's going to cost too much money. The unit economics don't work. It's just a sinkhole. Um, I think today you can acquire those folks much more effectively especially on the web in a, directly. Especially in a Facebook world, right? Facebook, Google, these folks are on the web, they're searching for answers, especially for when it's stuff that's and mission now you critical. And reach local who's got feet on the street helping All them get All other online. ways to get to them. And by the way, I'm not just talking about offline local businesses. I'm yeah. talking about they could deliver their service or product on the web as well. They, right. There's all different types of small and medium-sized businesses. And, and, and even just thinking more about New York, Etsy, and people like that who are engaging Enabling small Enabling small merchants. There's Foodsy lots of, right, and, and there's lots of different ways to go out and acquire those folks. I think also, over time, what you see with these businesses, I think Salesforce is an instructive example. I mean, we've yep. talked about this before. Yep. You know, it's a bit of a myth, but they, they did start lower and move up the chain. I think a lot of these companies can move up the chain over time as their product gets more sophisticated and they work with more customers and they, they, they understand the ins and outs. What I would tell any entrepreneur watching is if you haven't read The Innovator's Dilemma, you need to. I Absolutely. don't know if you read it, Clay Christensen. Yeah, it's, this is a classic disruptive and, idea. And the whole idea is you start with a lower price point and lower functionality and serving a lower end part of the market because you're not going to compete with Absolutely. you know the, the the big player who has deep functionality and deep R and D budgets. But over time, as your product increases and you have a delta in what you charge versus the the very large customers charging, eventually they trade down because Absolutely. the value is enough. And it ties into the minimum viable product thing. It's yeah. like identify a very clear customer, go at them with a very specific product that that fills their need and expand. And I think, you know, the same is true for the product as yeah. it is for the market itself. And we never got past Wharton with you. And okay. in fact, I'm glad we didn't start with elementary school. Huh. Uh, but you went to work in banking for a little bit, but you really cut your teeth, I think, if it's fair to say, at IAC. Tell yeah. me what you did at IAC. So I um, knew I, I did the bank thing to learn and, you know, I was mostly doing media and some internet and early internet stuff, um, but mostly large cap media, primarily M&A, you know, big transactions with like the likes of News Corp and Time Warner. And then we were actually looking at a, at a bunch of early internet stuff. It was, this is, you know, end of 99, 00, 01. It was like up, it was, it was, it was on the way down at that point. So kind of a lot of, a lot of broken assets, a lot of kind of interesting things. Um, and I just, but I just knew I never wanted to be a, a banker. I did it to learn, to meet people, to get a good, continue my education really. 
And I just was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to go work for IAC at the time when they had spun their media assets off or were spinning their media assets off to Vivendi. They had four and a half billion dollars in cash. And what did you do? I mean, you weren't yeah. like in the corp dev so or I acquisition So I started, I started there. Oh, you did? So okay. basically what happened was they had all this cash. Barry wanted to refocus the company on that being interactive, very, very Barry Diller. Diller. Yeah. And there was like a team of anywhere between five and seven of us that effectively said, okay, we had to like look at the internet and start with the strategy, the strategic planning, like what are the interesting areas of opportunity. They were very focused on commerce because they were they had HSN, Home Shopping Network. Yeah. Big business for them and television barriers but had been convinced for years about uh, the web and, and, and all of this. And other big internet properties, just so people know, they had City Search, they City had Search, Ask. Ticketmaster. We didn't have Ask yet. Oh, you didn't have Ask yet. We okay. bought Ask. Bought it. Ask. It, City Search, Ticketmaster. Uh, we just bought Hotels.com, Expedia. So pretty big um, properties. Yeah, and then we, you know, uh, that group ended up buying Lending Tree, Hotwire, um, Service Magic. Um, so this is a pretty big I, internet player. We probably did. Interv I mean, we, we did, I don't even know how many acquisitions when I was and there, when I from see, small to large. When I see um, investment banker presentations and they talk about viable exits, and obviously Google and Microsoft and Yahoo are on there, but IAC is always on the list. As, as small companies should know, but IAC is kind of like smaller price. Early it is. Stage. I mean, I, I think, you know. I don't want to say bottom no, tier. No, well, Barry is very disciplined. Right. He does not like. Is disciplined a, a code word for cheap? Uh, maybe. <laughs> he doesn't like to overpay for assets. Um, Which is another code word for cheap. Yeah. And uh, I That's think okay. he's cheap in sometimes a good way and maybe sometimes a less good way where we should have paid up for things that we didn't. Yeah. That's a longer conversation. But uh, the reality is he, he searches for value. But in that time, you know, this is like 01, 02, 03. I mean, there was a lot of value to be had, 04. And we were, you know, I was doing everything at that point from minority investments yeah. in companies all the way to acquisition. So that's where I, I, did I started. Did you have an operational role eventually at IC? So I started learning, the, I learned the investment trade there and, and really, and then kind of migrated when prices got really high. Barry got sort of frustrated and wanted to build some stuff, and I broke off with my boss at the time. We started an incubator, and okay. we launched a couple businesses out of that. One of them is Pronto, which is a shopping search business yep. here in New York. Uh, another one was Gifts.com, came out of that group that was kind of subsumed by Pronto as well, run by a great guy, a talented guy in New York named John Foley right now. And then ultimately, I, so I started moving more towards incubating stuff, and then I found myself starting this new kind of area of the company focused on digital media, which yeah. was a passion of mine, and a gentleman named Michael Jackson came into the company who had worked with Barry previously, came from television background. Different Not Michael different Jackson. Michael Jackson. <laughs> and we started trying to figure out things we could build, things we could buy um, to build up the, the digital media portfolio, and I ended up leading an acquisition of a company called Connected Ventures, which is the parent of collegehumor.com, which is the leading independent comedy uh, and really young male-focused site, content site on the web, uh, Busta Tees, which is a, a, a retail business, and Vimeo, which is kind of uh, really everyone knows taken off yeah. as, as the, the leader in sort of video sharing, yeah. uh, kind of different than what YouTube and, does. And, and am I right to say, were you COO there, or did you have So an basically, I, I first bought the company, and then uh, you, you for like IAC, so and then I, I, want, I really wanted to get closer and closer to the operation, so I joined Josh and Ricky, okay. who are the co-founders, to help them run the business. Okay. I was there for a while before I, before I left. And you joined Spark Capital in mm -hmm. September 2008. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but let's talk about Spark. Spark seems to have come out of nowhere. It seems to be one of this new breed. You know, there's a new breed that everybody's sort of talking about and has a certain brand cachet for being involved in high profile deals, whether it's uh, Twitter, whether it's uh, Boxy, whether it's Tumblr, whether it's, uh, as we talked about, AdMeld. Um, Tell me about when, when was uh, Spark formed and, and how has it arrived on the map so quickly? So uh, Spark was formed in 05 um, and you know, I, I think you have to give a lot. Which in, which in VC terms is not a long time. No, I mean we've been around this summer is five years, yeah. which is very young for a VC firm. Um, and, but it, it, the two founding uh, partners, Todd and Santo, 
uh, have a very long history in the venture business. So it wasn't, you know, Todd. And Todd had invested in Akamai, right? Yeah, Akamai and Qterra and a handful of very meaningful exits while he was at Battery Ventures for 10 years. Yeah. Santo was at Charles River before and back in the day was at BT Ventures. So these guys came from a venture pedigree. So they weren't starting carte blanche. They had history, track right. records, relationships, et cetera. Right. Um, uh, they brought in a couple other guys, Bijan, who you know, yeah. and, and, and we've spent, all spent some time together. Kind of came more from an operating background, but has you know, spent the last five years, I think, just done a tremendous job transitioning into a fantastic VC. And you know, built the team out around that. And Alex, who had also joined and uh, worked, had worked with, uh, was in, has a VC background as well, and had worked with the guys before, knew, knew Todd previously. Um, and, and the team kind of congealed, I think, you know, why successful? I think part of it is also the, the focus. So, so Spark came out with a very specific focus on media, technology, internet businesses, and kind of this, this thing we've, we call the conflux, which is the, the, the colliding of all these, of technology with these industries. And you are, I think it's fair to say, stage agnostic, maybe so a little bit more early stage, but stage two agnostic. Things. So, Within that kind of conflux, as we call it, we, we kind of start with the consumer and then work our way backwards in the chain. But we, we do invest in the infrastructure underlying sort of the value chain, the cable plant, the mobile plant, et cetera, you know, the, the wireline and wireless commu communications. Um, and that's the background that Todd and Santo come from as well. They've done a lot of those deals in the past. Right. Um, and so we're investing on the infrastructure side, but, but we're, and we're also investing on the consumer side, but we really start with the consumer and like what their needs are, what they're looking for, yeah. and then kind of work our way backwards in the chain and invest on both sides. In terms of our stage bias, I'd say that we are largely early stage investors, kind of seed and series A yeah. stage investors, and then we kind of selectively will make kind of, call them venture <laughs> growth investments, in areas that we really believe in, companies that are leading those markets and entrepreneurs that we really like, know, et cetera. And so we're, we're a bit agnostic, but we're, we're, we're kind of largely an early stage firm with kind of a selective is, growth focus. Is the same true about location, which is more investments in Northeast, but open-minded to national practice? Yeah, we're, we're, we're very open-minded geographically. We've clustered um, in the Northeast and on the West Coast, uh, sprinkled, uh, there's a couple things we've done in Europe, but we, we really folk, we, we make sure that it's a company we understand, people we know, work with co-investors that are great, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we, we do deals there as well. Uh, but you know, actually our largest cluster is in New York. I think we have, I, I could, um, I'm probably wrong on this, but it, it's 14 wow. companies in New York now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's part accident, it's part not. I think Bijan really did an excellent job mining the market early. I think Santo did an excellent job as well. Todd and Alex both have companies here. I now have uh, soon to be three companies is, here. Is Boston as a market not as early stage friendly as New York is? No, I don't think it's about early well, every, stage friendly. Every VC that I saw, because I spent some time in Boston, and every everyone that I went to see said that they're in New York all the time. I think Boston, look, it's not no secret that Boston was an infrastructure town. Yeah. Uh, and largely, a lot of the guts of, of the web and, yeah. and mobile communications were funded out of and built out of Boston uh, and out of MIT and a lot of the companies that came out of there. And by the way, that continues, yeah. but a lot of that infrastructure has been built already yeah. and now it's incremental and we're, I mean, there's gonna be new standards, there's new plant, there's new upgrades, there's lots of stuff to do. And that still comes out of, out of Boston. I just think as it relates to um, the consumer web, I think there's great stuff in Boston, but I think we've seen New York rise tremendously. So comparatively, we're seeing a lot more stuff in New York and that has to do with you know, the nature of entrepreneurs here, the industries that thrive here, be it financial services, retail, um, um, advertising and media, et cetera, et cetera, where there's right. been a lot of innovation. And I think, you know, people want to live here. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a fun, cool town. Yeah. And uh, I think that matters. At so the end Boston's of the day. not cool. No, I, I think <laughs> it is, but I'm people, totally kidding. You know, I, I know when I was going to But I will tell you, Lakers are up two games, one. I'm a Knicks fan, so oh, you are. I got nothing to be happy about right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm applauding Mayor Mike Derek, for the come on Braun thing. Did you watch the game at all? Did you see last night? Yeah. I was I, had, I was at a dinner, but I... I Derek Fisher yeah, just awesome. tore up the fourth you know who quarter. He, Derek, I put Derek Fisher in those in that class of like Robert Ory. Yeah. Derek Fisher. Yeah. You know, like guys that when like, when it really matters, 
they come to play. They they're cool. gamers. They stay cool. Derek Jeter. I mean, think I think Derek Jeter's on a, on a different Kobe. level. Yeah. I think Derek Jeter's like, but that's my own Yankee bias. But, but I can't say this here because I'm a Phillies fan. So, no. You know, I, I, I'll try not to attack. That's uh, a National League, American yeah. League. Come on. But uh, but honestly, Derek Fisher last night was just. Yeah, he's awesome. And uh, and so gracious after the game, and he he almost was in tears. You got to give was, Rondo a lot of credit though. Yeah. And he's gonna be he's a gamer like that. That guy is gonna be. Uh, a real gamer for a long time. We could do an ESPN show after. Listen, <laughs> you know, Keith Oberman called me this morning. I didn't want to tell you. Yeah, okay. No He's going to bring you over. There no you go. Um, let's, let, I, I do want to, uh, first of all, talk about a deal that you guys are involved with because we're actually sitting in the offices today of Next right. New Networks. And this is a, a topic that's very interesting to me, um, not just in doing a web series, but I live in L.A., I'm so fascinated by where media is going to be. When we think about the internet, it's both a communication platform and an entertainment platform and an education platform. And a and that, social platform. And a social platform. But, but social, I think, is an element of the it's other things, all the, right? All the verticals. But if I think about it, and I think we've had such innovation in Web 1.0, you know, not just a two-way conversation, but if I look at the Huffington Post and how uh, instrumental that's been in changing the way news is, uh, created and consumed and video we're really just scratching the surface tell me about next new networks so next new networks is the leading independent provider of original programming for the web okay um, they do short form and longer form stuff they create their own stuff in-house but increasingly they are working with uh, what they call next new creators to help other creative folks out there uh, make the stuff they want to make get it up and distribute it online and monetize it effectively through channel partners like YouTube and other places on the web where there are big audiences and also driving it direct. Um, you know, they've uh, been around for a little while, have established great credibility in that market. They've worked with fantastic people. It was started by a couple folks that came out of the business uh, who really just had a, had a sense for the, for the creative world. and. And, and for building creative assets. And you know they're at that point now where they're really starting to scale both the video views and the, the number of the creators. And they've gotten the model at a, to a point where they can bring the cost of making that stuff down so, so much, where the unit economics are starting to make a lot of sense. You know, Video advertising, as we know, very much on the rise. CPMs are yeah. high and, and for good reason. And, and do you know, if you bring and it's the cost of, of creation down, you get scale. It's, it's a very kind of model. unfair to dig into the details on something that we didn't talk about ahead of time. But do you know? I mean, is it is a lot of the focus pre-roll, or is it rich internet advertising it's both. around the but video? They do pre-roll, and then they do some other formats, and they are constantly testing and balancing the most effective ad formats for advertisers, you know, in terms of delivering audience for advertisers, and also in terms of um, what consumers, you know, the, the being consumer friendly and making sure that they have a great experience. And that's, look, that's the balance with any advertising in any medium. Do you, is, do you ever spend time on Hulu? Are you a Hulu consumer? I spend a fair bit of time on, on Hulu, but, but I have to tell you, not a ton. Okay. I'm like a bit, you know, I don't watch a lot of television. There, are, I, I watch sports, as okay. you, as you yeah. probably picked up. Yeah. Um, and I, there are a, f a few shows that I'm really into. Um, and I will often just, if I can't catch them or DVR them, I pretty much DVR all of them. Yeah. I, I occasionally will buy them on iTunes, just like just have them downloaded on my machine, take them when I'm traveling, yeah. or going wherever for for who knows what. Um, that's sort of my use case. I definitely have been on Hulu and watch Hulu a fair bit, but it's not my... The funny uh, thing to me about Hulu and advertising is any... T I, I am a consumer of Hulu, and it tends to be if I watch something in serialized format. Um, the biggest thing that's drawn me away from Hulu is I used to consume The Daily Show on it, right? And I'd either DVR it or I'd watch it on Hulu, and it's not on Hulu anymore. Oh, maybe it was, was it on YouTube? No, it was on Hulu. And uh, now it I'm was, just watching, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember for a second. Uh, now I watch it on Comedy Central. But that wasn't what I wanted to talk about was uh, they always say that they're sold out, always. And yet every ad I ever see on it is a combination of one of two things. Either a schlocky ad, and I don't want to name the firm, I usually do when we're not on film, but there's this one firm that always advertises. It's like a little crappy internet company like that advertises, or it's <laughs> PSA. A public service announcement, and yeah. you can't tell me you're completely sold out on inventory when you're doing Listen, schlock. You've raised money before, PSA, right? Yes. Yeah. Scarcity value. Yeah. 
everybody wants into what they think they can have, right? Yeah. And same with a company, it's the same with a fund, it's the yeah. same with advertising. Yeah. The 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 more so there's demand too much, too much inventory? Create, or? Well, I think that it's demand creation tool. Like okay. they create scarcity value. They're trying to let advertisers know and the community know okay. that Hulu is sold out. Okay. And if you want Hulu, you're yeah. gonna have to pay thirty dollars whatever the number but, but, is. Like, come on. Advertisers must must log on to Hulu and say, well, how are you sold out they if you're do. running freaking PSAs again? They do, yeah. um, but you know. I mean, I want to save the forest like anyone, but it's all, part, it's all part of the game, you <laughs> know. And you. until we move to a world where the whole thing is end-to-end -end digital, and I don't think we're that far off from it. And you know, we, we were talking about AdMeld before, yeah. a portfolio company of ours in New York that's just killing it. So t tell everybody what AdMeld does. Uh, AdMeld is uh, the leading real-time bidding exchange, or one of the leading, I think, the leading real-time premium real-time bidding uh, inventory exchange on the web. So effectively, uh, premium publishers put their inventory into the system, and in real time, advertisers can go and bid on that inventory. It's, they can append all kinds of data it to it. sounds like it's the reverse of invite media. It's uh, Well, no, invite media is a big customer. In, invite media, if I understand it right, is a DSP, which means uh, it's helping the advertisers buy and creating uh, behavioral data and buying opportunities to buy. Yeah, it's a demand side platform. Yeah, demand side platform. Which helps demand meaning the demand advertising. meaning advertising, which helps them. But buy. AdMeld is more publisher centric, isn't uh, it? It's both. Oh, it's, it is. it's a marketplace, okay. and so it, but it's it not started, an exchange. It is. Not, oh, it is. It is. So they compete with Right Media and yes. with Ad ECN yes. and, and with Google. Google. Correct. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Yeah. That. Well, they started. It's probably because. Early I thought on, it was closer to Rubicon. Er, and early on, they started um, very much like Rubicon or Pubmatic, yeah. um, working with premium publishers. Specific, but they had a, a great selection of premium publishers they were working with to help them optimize their remnant inventory. Yeah. Over time, they realized that it was far more efficient to... I just want to make sure remnant inventory is that inventory which isn't which sold. Which isn't sold. Yeah, premium inventory which your direct sales team is normally it's selling. It's the kind of inventory that Hulu doesn't have. <laughs> Allegedly. Um, allegedly, allegedly. So, but uh, <laughs> I love Hulu, but I, I, love just, Hulu I don't understand this freaking thing about saying you're sold out. Anyway, <laughs> Listen, uh, guys, I, I know you're not sold out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but so, Brandon, CPS. Yeah, so I you, want you, start, you started by doing that. So, anyhow, they started by doing that. They moved um, to uh, they moved to really be a marketplace because it's just it's far more efficient for both sides of the equation to run that inventory through a real-time bidding marketplace. Um, and de uh, the demand side platforms like Invite sit on the demand side, which is the advertiser side, and they help publish, they help advertisers, excuse me, buy inventory in real time off those exchanges yeah. by appending uh, you know, data on those users, intentionality data, demographic data, you know, all kinds of segments. It's getting more and more sophisticated uh, through cookies and pixels, et cetera, et cetera. And that, the way that market you know is fascinating. You know what I found really interesting is when you think about every website today uses Google Analytics, every, well, I mean, the Until top- Omniture upsells them. I was going to say the top <laughs> end of the market uses Omniture, but yeah. what I meant is, the, let's call it the long tail, yep. uses a Google Analytics, which you know is a free product. And having Google Analytics lets you track your referring traffic mm -hmm. and how it converts and how many people come and so on and so forth. Um, but Google Analytics, like Google in general, is dumb. And what I mean is, yeah. it doesn't know who you are. Oh, and, garbage and, in, garbage out but, problem. But, but what, well, okay, so I won't say it's complete garbage. They have data. No, no, but no. they're dumb relative to who you are. And what interests me is Facebook this week released an analytics product I, I'm told, I haven't played with it yet, that it'll do similar stuff to Google, but instead it'll actually tell you, if you log in with Facebook Connect, uh, information about the people. So now I don't only know who referred you and how did my traffic spike and what content did you consume. I knew that you're a 28-year-old woman who's engaged to be married, whatever. Yes, and I, so there's two ways in which products like Google Analytics can be dumb. I use the term loosely, but one, if, if you don't, set it up correctly to track the right things. Which nobody does. Which uh, most people don't do, because yeah. it's actually, you gotta get in there. Yeah. I mean, I remember doing this for Vimeo and College Humor, it's like, you know, we actually, br we, we had hired a consultant to help us structure this thing, because, you know, I had some friends at Google who were helpful, but yeah. it's a free product, there wasn't a ton of customer support. Yeah. There's some pretty sophisticated stuff, this is 
going back years that you could do with it, and increasingly so. Yeah. And especially as you go into the to the higher end analytics packages, and if you don't set it up correctly, you're just not going to get the value out of it. So I think that's number one. You yeah. Really need to make sure you're getting the right and, data, and, and then and secondarily, importantly, Google doesn't know who you are when you're right. There. And then secondarily, to your point. Um, Adding data on the individual, I think, is incredibly powerful, and we could get into a really long discussion on Facebook and yeah. their value as a company and the ad network that and they're they, eventually building and, and, and they, what connects really moment. all about. Yeah. <laughs> we could talk about all that stuff. Oh, we won't. Uh, but we won't. But I will just say that yes, uh, having a lot of data on who individuals are yeah. is very, very powerful. Yeah, and valuable. what they do, and, and what they read, and what they're interested in, and who they're friends with. That stuff's pretty powerful. Uh, you know, life is scary. Um, tell, or, or open. Tell me about the Spark Capital website. Huh, you know, that was a source it's, of it's, real... My, my, my read, my read is <laughs> it's, it's uh, irreverent in a kind of nice, funny way. Like, I, if I look at Sequoia Capital, I'm like, well, that's irreverent no, in a different sort no, of No, I'm like, I don't get it. Like, I understand you're trying to emphasize it's about, I guess it's about search or whatever, but for me, it's- It uh, says, we're the firm that invested in Google. Google. That's what I read in <laughs> that's it. That's what I see. That's what I read in it. I mean, but it doesn't make box? sense, but- uh, You know would, what? If I, if I was the firm that invested in Google, I- Sequoia Capital, <laughs> what, however you rank it, is in the top three venture capital firms over the last 40 years, so I'm not taking anything away from them. No. Uh, website, not so much. But uh, but Spark Out, I love your website and it's really irreverent. So How did that come about? It and is, about, is the culture of your well, firm irreverent? One is, um, I think it does reflect the culture of our firm. I, I think, um, you know, we're uh, a bunch of different personalities um, that come together and somehow work in a symbiotic fashion. I think actually it's part of what makes us work is that we're all so different. Who led the project? Um, Todd led the project and Todd is, if you know Todd, is a very smart, very funny, very decent, good, irreverent guy. Okay. Um, but I think the character of our firm is we have personality yeah. and we wanted that to come through on the website. We had a horribly shitty site yeah. before we put this one Did up. Did it feel like a lawyer site? Because most VC sites feel like lawyer sites. I shouldn't sites. say this because yeah. Santo literally built it and he's uh, gonna kill me yeah. if he sees this. <laughs> it, was, it was great for Santo having built it, yeah. but uh, you know, being the the resident you know coder, computer scientist in the group. Yeah. But um, but the engineering guy in the group. But but um, uh, Todd really took on this project, and everybody was kind of giving him a hard time. You know how venture firms are with yeah. a thing like a website. But to his credit, and you know, it, it really came out great. And I think it. Look, I think there's a lot of money out there. Yeah. And at the end of the day we differentiate ourselves as people. And your, and your website says something about your personality. I mean, First Round has launched a new version of their website yep. where they have their Twitter stream. Yep. They all blog, you know, that says something about the firm. True Ventures does something that I really like that we plan to copy, which is they, well, you know, you're supposed to rip off I copy a lot of stuff from yeah. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as do I. And, uh, and they've, they've all, what they do is they take their portfolio companies who list the lawyers that they like and yeah. uh, the uh, interim CFOs that they like and the recruiters that they like and they don't have to like put a true stamp on no, them and say absolutely. we chose you know Joey Tran over someone else but yeah. they just had to put that's I think it's helpful. Know, that is actually something that you know uh, constructive criticism we haven't done the best job at and it is it's on our roadmap to do more of for our portfolio companies I think we, we've been a little kind of short-staffed on well, that you front. Can, you can copy me. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm gonna copy true. Listen, <laughs> I'm down to copy anybody. Yeah, to me too. Work. You know, like the, the USV guys did an interesting yeah. thing. They took a portfolio company of theirs, Indeed, yeah. and they basically did for all their companies, they used an Indeed search for all the available jobs, right? So yeah. they're using a portfolio company. They're, they're basically, they found a very um, web 2.0 kind of low impact way to do job listings without having to like constantly get people sending you resumes. Exactly. And blah, blah. Or, or job specs or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think I think that's important. I think we need to do more of that as well. Gotcha. And I do, I, I, I do want to talk about deals this week, and I do want to talk about our sponsor, importantly. Uh, but just in case anyone doesn't know, and I didn't want to emphasize it because you get talked about all the time, but Spark Capital invested in Twitter mm -hmm. very early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, the B round of Twitter. B round. Uh, uh, yeah, after USV. 
did the first institutional round and, and we did the uh, second. Yeah, and so, but it wasn't the 100 million plus, billion dollar plus no. round. Um, and you also are an investor in Tumblr. Mm -hmm. um, so Lotica and Boxy and, and other companies we've talked about. But let me just take a moment to talk about our sponsor uh, because that's what pays for this to be on the air. It's a company called PickClick. I've talked about it every week, but I enjoy talking about it because it's a neat product. It's P-I-C-C-L-I-C-K, PickClick.com. Uh, and the idea behind PickClick came from Ryan in San Diego who said a lot of uh, the way that you consume and find information on the web these days is difficult. You go and you, you look through listings on eBay, on Etsy, on other products, and he created a visual metaphor for searching for that. And my analogy always with this is, um, do you remember the old days, Craigslist? I don't know if you ever used Craigslist to search for a flat or something like that, an mm -hmm. apartment or a house. And you had to search through that, and then you had to go to Google, and you had to then kind of plot it on a map. And there was a website called housingmaps.com that did a mashup between the two where you could visually go search for what you wanted to. And I think that was the original company that people started talking about the word mashup on. I think that, that's what popularized. Uh, they didn't create the term mashup, but I think that's what popularized it. And PickClick's kind of doing some of that. So right now um, on dating, you can go and you can, you can search for uh, you know, your woman of your dreams on using PickClick, which is really just a front end. Originally for Match.com, they switched over to Plenty of Fish. Um, if you're searching for recipes, and uh, I, I don't cook, I, uh, I eat. But, um, I do both. Yeah, you do both. So if I, I don't know, if I was cooking. More of the latter than the former. Okay, though. and if I wanted to make, I don't know, what's one dish you like to cook? Oh, all kinds of stuff, but uh, like a casserole. Take a, no, I don't do the casserole so okay. much. I'm more into like really meats, and okay. fish, and gotcha. kind of healthy, good. So, so you want to do a nice grilled fish, and you want to kind of find a, a good recipe for Dover sole. Um, you know, you can actually type it in, and what Going they fancy on us. What they do? I lived in England. Dover yeah. sole was big there, and uh, and and what they do is they do a front end for I think it's allrecipes.com, yeah. and that helps you to drill down and find the information. I I'm a very visual thinker, so I think the idea of a visual metaphor is good. Oh, so they're our sponsor for our show. Uh, they've had a lot of success, and uh, with with the sponsorship, so they've actually started sponsoring three of the other this weekend shows. And if you want to sponsor, you can sponsor, and you're going to like this, by typing in mo, M-O, at thisweekend.com. <laughs> that will not go to Mo Koifman, uh, but the gentleman who handles advertising on behalf of That's This Weekend is Mo. Well, I, sh I think it's also important to let folks know that the show is sold out. Yeah, so it is sold out. Sold We're out. only premium inventory, no sold remnant, out. no PSAs. Advertisers sold out. If you want in, going to be tough. But I know <laughs> Come why. <on>. No big <laughs> deal. Let's talk about some deals. The, the, I, I usually have something I call deal of the week, yeah. and it doesn't mean it's the best value of the week. It's just something that really interests me. Okay. And what really interests me this week is a deal called Book Renter. Mm -hmm. Book Renter, I actually saw before they raised their A round. Uh, young gentleman out of Google had founded it, come up with the idea, had brought in a senior team. Um, he was. Uh, I don't want to say struggling to raise capital, but he, it didn't like walk in the door right away. Um, partially because there was a much bigger, much better finance company called Chegg, C-H-E-G-G. -G. The idea behind Chegg, the idea behind Book Renter is if you take college students who want textbooks, and the textbooks are the same for many years in a row, do you really want to spend $85 on a textbook when some other schmo just had it last quarter and can sell it to you for 40. Right. And the idea is behind the model is you can get four or five turns on a book, meaning they could buy the book and they might even buy it. I know Chegg was buying used, Book Renter was buying new. And if I buy that book as, as Book Renter at $85 and I can turn it, you know, the first time, I can't sell it for 85 the first time, but maybe for 40 and the next time for 32. It's okay, and the next the time first time, time if you're actually selling it in market, you're, you're not making much money on it. Yeah, but <laughs> even in this case, they're taking a loss yeah. because they're doing the rental model yep. because you have to give that book back at the end. And the idea is... Well, not, not to mention all the logistics and distribution centers, and we, we can get to that, but yeah. there's a lot of so, infrastructure costs in this business That's as well. true. And so I just want to say, so Chegg raised money. Uh, it says here they've done, so Chegg had previously raised money, which was $144 million in debt and equity. Yep. 
Um, Book Renner just announced another $10 million. It was led by Norwest and Storm Ventures and Adams Capital. The total amount they've raised to date is $16 million. So what's going on in this sector? I mean, is everybody just buying used now? Well, I, I think, um, so this is a, a kind of a classic example of bringing efficiency to an inefficient market on the web. I think in many ways it's a web 1.0 model, I'll qualify that in a moment, um, but, a, but a very powerful one. So, you know, students, there's, uh, textbooks are the third biggest piece of uh, spending in the education sector. We okay. know how big the education sector Switch. is. Yeah. So a ton of money is spent on textbooks every yeah. year. This is a model for the same books that are recycled over and over again, and maybe you know, okay, a new edition comes out, but largely the, the same. The new edition comes out so they can sell you the new book. book right? It's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, it just uses the kind of marketplace dynamics of the web to make it far more efficient. So Netflix type model for books. It allows yeah. folks to get them used. Students don't care. These aren't books that they want to put on their bookshelves at the end of the day. They're stuff that they need to learn and is ultimately there, they're going to they're going to give up is there a fear i know kindle came out with a small version and then they came out with a bigger version and a lot of the media at the time was saying they were going to target the textbook yeah market. so I'm, is I'm, there a way that yeah. they're getting in the wrong market I'm, so i'm going to get there um because i think that that's the key question here but i will say that first and foremost um it's a very powerful if and, and even the the edu institutions the the universities have now gotten behind it where where, where they weren't initially because it's cutting the cost of, of education and yeah. that is a very powerful thing so fundamentally if you can get a used book for much less than the cost of a new book and you're not going to keep that book forever it's a no-brainer yeah um, so the business is working there's a lot of infrastructure a lot of distribution that they've built they're largely a logistics company right. like Netflix yeah. is was talk about that and logistics um, and financing because they have yeah. to be able to finance to finance yeah. the books there's big working capital requirements there's inventory requirements yeah. they have to like move stuff in and out of warehouses yeah it's like serious operation that's a core competency of the business um, but it's it's in, it's churning cash right now because it works and it's much better than the current model of you know buying new books every time however and the reason I say it's a web 1.0 company is I think the web 2.0 incarnation of what, how we're going to be educated and learn and what textbooks or ma learning materials are going to look like in the future is very different than you know, how it's being published and printed today. I think fundamentally it's going to be digital. And fundamentally I think it's going to be dynamic and interactive and mixed media. And it's just, it's going to be a different type of experience. And I've seen some companies, there's a very interesting company on the West Coast called Inklink. We've seen a handful of others that are, are trying to help you know, publishers rethink that and yeah. actually do that. So the danger with a Chegg uh, or, or, Book or, or Book Runner or any of these companies is, is the, uh, the disintermediation challenge. You know, you may, so the, the uh, you know, original market selling new books, now you have this great innovative model of kind of bringing that online but doing it in a more efficient way and making, you know, a marketplace for used books. But fundamentally, you get leapfrogged by this entirely new technology that's a replacement technology. I mean, it's interesting, I'll, I'll say this, and, and this is where I think we should take the conversation, is if I think about the deals I've been wrong on, and you know, there have been, there have been some, like I'm just completely off base on, the biggest one on the top of my list would be Netflix. Because mm -hmm. it came out, I'm like, how the F do you get into a market that's so obviously disappearing, and yet it hasn't disappeared, and they've grown, and people want DVD. And my hypothesis was there's a, short window, and I don't know if the window is three to four to five years, where, yeah, finding people take DVD, but it's all gonna be digital distribution, yeah. and that's true, but it turned out to be 10 years rather than five, and Netflix in the process of So there's, there's three reasons why you would, given the threat of disintermediation, invest in the category. Yeah. Uh, and then we can talk about the company specifically. One is that it's gonna take longer than people think. Yeah. That solves kind of a runway cash flow problem. It doesn't solve necessarily an exit problem because right. if you're gonna take this thing public or somebody's gonna buy it at the end of the day, um, those people need to believe that it's a sustainable business. Otherwise, yeah. you're not gonna get the multiple. Sure. They're gonna just look at the discounted value of your future cash flows and you know it's a cash flow business yeah. and on, this, on this trajectory. Um, you know, the, the, the other things are, um, Two, you believe that they you could make they can make the Netflix style shift. Yeah. So they can take this digital this uh, 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 print. 
business yeah. and use the built-in audience space to build right. a digital business. Right. So ne it's the Netflix is now allowing digital downloads Correct. and they're transitioning. Instead of getting the DVDs in the mail, you're pulling the the, the And the in a way, outflow. Netflix now has market power because they're selling so many of Because they have such a built-in install base that all of a sudden they're, they be over, like they switch to be a very they large distributor. They have pricing power so, with the So two suppliers. things about yeah. that. One is you got to hand the management team at Netflix uh, just a tremendous amount of yeah, credit for totally, being able to pivot like that. Totally agree. I mean, they th that that is just an impressive company and an unbelievable story. Yeah. And you know, we say it all the time that it's the other execution. Read, right? Yeah, it's Reed Hastings. Hastings. It's that re execution yeah. is so fundamentally important. You know, there's so many good ideas out there, but execution is where it's all at. Yeah. Is a classic example of that. Um, so, so give them a ton of credit. The, the, the one difference I see between that market and this market, that there may be a handful, but one big difference is, you know, there you're taking something that's delivered on a disc, you're taking the exact same thing and just putting it on the web and streaming. Yeah. So you need a CDN and you need some stuff and you need to host it and there's things you need to do, but that's largely commoditized at this point. I don't think that's true in the textbook world. Like, I don't think just taking a textbook and putting it on the web or making it digital with a few hyperlinks is how it's so going to So your unfold. assertion would be a Chegg or a book renter uh, could win and create a long-term sustainable business if they can take the infrastructure that they build in the physical world and find the right way to pivot into the digital no, world. I'd say clearly if they can, textbooks are going digital. No, I, I'd say if they can they may have a chance to win yeah. if they can manage the decline in the infrastructure of the physical world because that world will play no part in their new business. Like right. Those warehouses don't mean jack when it comes to distributing. Yeah, but Netflix says the same thing, right? No, that's, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. They need to manage that business from a, as a cash cow yeah. and they need to somehow pivot their company into a digital model, which means not just delivering the same um, inventory on the web, but rethinking and reinventing what a textbook looks like in a digital environment. And that is yeah. the area that I think you know is going to be the hardest for them to do as an incumbent, managing all that infrastructure, et cetera, and versus making the transition. and making the transition, and not just putting it on the web, but reinventing it for the web. That right. is a much tougher challenge. So, right. so that, that to me is the question there. That has a lot to do with the management team execution, looking at the startup environment, you know, where the competition is going to come from, et cetera. Yeah. The, the third thing I will say to finish the point, and I think is the the wild card here is the audience base, and I've heard this said a million different times, and it's very hard to pull off. But they, over, you know, take a Chag or a book renter or whatever it is, they have a massive database of EDU yeah. email addresses yeah. and customers, sure. effectively. Course, yeah. What can you do with that? Okay, I, that's the red herring here. Right. I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. So the idea them is, in could there be third-party businesses? Third-party businesses, way other, ways to, other ways to market to that, other ways to make money. To There's people. 15 different things. So we need to move on. Yeah. Uh, I do want to just ask: Are we going to be cut off hard at the end of the hour, or can we overrun by five minutes? We're over by five we can minutes. overrun. We get. So we're going to have to move quickly through Great. deals, Mo. Um, I do want to say: So Chegg had, has raised 10 times the capital of Book Renter, and I think that'll be the challenge. But let's not go there. Yep. The next deal. I like to talk about is called Trazzler. I'm going to do this one really quickly, but I, I want to make sure we get through some of these. A million dollar seed round. Um, it's Adam Rugel. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Biz Stone, yep. co-founder of Twitter. And what it's actually doing is creating an online travel guide served up in stream in the way Twitter is with a restricted amount.
Jack and Bitly and everybody else. Uh, Founder Collective, of course, we both know them, uh, and AOL Ventures. Yep. Um, what's going on with Tresnor? So, very high level, great guy. Um, travel market is massive. Um, been a lot of innovation on the booking side, a very little innovation on the planning side to date. Lots of people trying to go at this, the opportunity. You have a really smart guy going at it with a, with a very focused social product and very early, lots of early Does stage it guys. Does make sense to have seven investors? I mean, what is it, like $499 each I or mean, something? I mean, like, you why know, would you have seven investors? You know as well as I do that that's how these angel syndicates work. I think to the extent that you can get value out of all of them in the areas that they bring value respectively, I think it's great. But if they all own certainly doesn't one, hurt you. But if they all own one point four percent of your company, are they really going to get out Does of there? Does it harm him by having everybody? I, I th are you asking the question about Adam or about the investors? I'm asking both because I have a belief that if you give one point four percent, I'm making the number up. 1.4% to seven or eight people, no one has enough skin in the game to allocate the kind of time that they need to, to help you succeed, with one exception. Ron mode. Conway. No, no, well, Ron, <laughs> Ron Conway's Ron, right? Uh, I've taken to calling Ron the S&P 500, okay. right? Because Ron gets in every deal, so in a way he's a bellwether for the industry, and you can't try to do 30% of Ron Conway because that's like doing 30% of the S&P. If, if you're gonna model the industry, you gotta do every deal. Everyone wants Ron and everyone loves Ron. But aside from that, if you become Zynga and somebody owns 1.4% of you, they're gonna kill themselves to help you, right? Or if you become Twitter or if you become Facebook. But if you don't become an immediate success and you have seven guys who each own 1.4% of you, I sort of wonder. I think it's a fundamentally, it's a very individual question. I don't think you can answer it en masse. There are people out there that are angels, lots of companies, really add value. You know, it depends how much time do they spend on this. Is it a full-time thing? Is it a part-time thing? It, it's so nuanced, it's very so tough to answer. But my recommendation, I'm going to take a harder line. If you are Adam Rugel, who I presume quite talented, was there at the start of Twitter, is surrounded by all sorts of people who have money and the ability to help him uh, succeed, I think you can get away with it. If you're a first-time entrepreneur, I personally would choose to at least find one investor who has a little more skin in the game sure. and, uh, and maybe the other people round out the 1.4. Yeah. But by the way, to be fair to these guys, that may be the case. I mean, it could be, for example, that, uh, I don't know, Steve Case maybe has half the round, or I doubt it, but uh, Betaworks maybe has half the round. So Yeah, look, I I, I'm, I'm all for having a lead investor who can really shepherd the company, but I don't think there's any downside in having a series of really smart, talented guys who you can tap into for advice, for their network, for just counsel, whether you're a first-time entrepreneur or a multi-time entrepreneur. So I'm going to go through some deals and not ask you because I have one deal I really want to ask you about. Hope Look raised money this week. It was $31 million Series C by Insight Venture Partners. What I found interesting, uh, if everybody probably knows by now because we talk about it all the time because everyone's raising money. They compete with Guilt Group, they compete with Rue La La, it's this private shopping. I know the founder, I know they're doing incredibly well. Um, Insight led their last round and led this round and that's what I find most interesting about this deal. Yep. That, that they haven't that they haven't brought in a new investor and that they wrote a that thirty-one could, million. That cuts budget. both ways. I know, I know. We we don't know what the deals are on that, but forty-one million total yeah. raise. I suspect it was we need to keep up with Gilt Group. Matrix and be. GA just put more money into Gilt, yeah. so and they're the existing exactly. investors. So uh, the other one that I don't want to talk about too much because I want to ask you about one that I think isn't you have some insight on. Rock, you also raised money. Uh, this is another example of previous investors putting in more money. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> RockU Rock you and Slide were the original widget companies that were going to capitalize on Facebook mm -hmm. and all the social networks and getting users engaged with more than just the uh, application itself. And somehow Zynga became the big company, but I'm told RockU is doing incredibly well still. And what they figured out was engagement. How do you engage people in an ad, and effectively have they become an ad network? Yeah. Or is it? They have a massive install base, and they yeah. have a massive ad network now. And, and uh, I spent some time with Lance Dakota. I found him to be incredibly bright and talented and thoughtful on the topic of how you engage users in the ad, because at a time where you had either just text links or banner ads, he was saying, no, the ad should be a quiz. 
The ad should be engagement. The ad should involve your social community. And I think that was the kind of magic to yep. rock you. And slides seems to have disappeared. Or am I wrong? I don't know. I, I, don't, I hear, don't know, actually. I don't hear much about slide anymore, but that doesn't mean that they're not doing amazing. But I want to ask you about Pandora. Okay. Pandora raised money. Pandora was against the ropes. There yep. was an idea that they might at one point go bankrupt. They've raised $56.3 million in total. Uh, it says undisclosed amount of investment, but the investors include GGV Capital and Allen and Company. They'd previously raised $35 million. They brought in a new CFO, Steve Cakebread. Yeah, I they're, know they're him. prepping for an IPO. Steve used to be the CFO at Salesforce.com. Yeah. That kind of led us through. And I think his family actually owns Cake Bread Cellars, the winery in, in Napa Valley, although he never gave me any. And uh, and I guess uh, uh, Pandora competes with Spotify. Is that Last FM? Um, or or are they in a class? Are no, they in a class? I think they own? compete with a lot of them. But I think Pandora. Well, anybody that knows me knows I'm a big music geek. Um, I um, Pandora has done something very interesting. I'm not the biggest Pandora user because okay. I find that Pandora. Um, this is. I hope this comes off right, but I find that Pandora is very self-reinforcing, meaning you know you like X, so you get a lot more of things that are like X. As opposed to new discovery? Correct. Like I'm much more focused on finding new stuff. Where do you find new music? I find new music from Hype Machine, okay. uh, Extension.fm uh, dot is a company that we just seeded that okay. I'm finding a lot of music from, from blogs, from other people. Do you like music as a Tumblr. category to invest in? Um, I, I, I don't like it as a category to invest in generally, although I think there are pockets of opportunity. Yeah. But generally, it's been a very tough category for all the obvious reasons. There's a lot of entrepreneurs I, right. love, I love in the category. There's Blip FM. There's yeah. There's uh, top spin media. There's a lot of people trying to change it, but it's a tough industry to right. change. But, and the thing about Pandora is, so they, they help you find music that's like other music that you like. They're effectively, it's, it's a new kind of radio. Yeah. And people like radio because it's easy. The average person who's not a crazy music geek yeah. just likes to put something on that they like and hear other songs that they like too. And yeah. Pandora does that very effectively. It's like genius on a on Exactly. Apple, yeah. So with that, um, they've also, They've gone, you know, legit the whole way. They've been paying the licensing uh, streams. They don't have to pay the really onerous licensing fees because they're not allowing you to selectively play songs. So it's very much like radio. Yeah. They got a display ad model working, and increasingly, and I think this will be kind of a bigger trend on the web. They're doing in-stream audio ads, which I think eventually are going to have a very big place to play is that in music like, on like the web. Is Target like radio. Spot? Is yeah, Target, Target Spot is a company that's enabling that. That's enabling that. Um, so you know, that, that kind of thing is working. And I think if you have a very large mainstream audience, you provide them with an internet product that uh, is easy to use and reinforces taste that they have, and you don't pay the ridiculous licensing fees, and you can get a, a model that works on the ad side, you know, I think you'll come out so the other end. They okay. have 50 million users. It's a big number. Um, I've always heard the word, which is uh, the the idea, which is that you tend to listen to music in life that you listened to when you were 30. So, I'm a Pandora listener. Like you know, I I, God, I, I better I'm I better really listen up then. I'm stuck in that Nirvana grunge, you know, kind of world. Do you listen? You're in Boston. Do you listen to Zoe Radio? Do you know not Zoe? much? I don't. You know, I'm not a big radio guy. But this is. Uh, I mean, you should check it out. I think it's on the internet, and it's uh, Ian Rogers who runs sure Top Spin. It's yeah. his, his daughter is at MIT, and she curates a radio show. And everyone that I talk oh. to, who's kind of more avant-garde in music, tells me to listen. I do to listen it. to a little. Um, I listen to some of the Austin radio stations occasionally, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on online. But I listen to some. B Actually, the BBC has some interesting right. uh, music out of the UK. If you if you have any interest in European or electronic music, it's kind of interesting. I, like you know, I lived there for 11 years. Exactly. Uh, we should finish here for two things. One is I want to say a big thank you to PickClick, Pick Click, Pick Click.com. Uh, please go there, check it out. If you like what you see, maybe send out a tweet, uh, tell other people about it. We tend to like that company. Um, and I want to say a big thank you both to Next New Networks for allowing us to film here today, and of, co of course, to Mo Koifman, Spark Capital. Good to see you. Thanks a lot.